On this episode of Doing the Most, we're clearing up 10 myths and half-truths about natural brewing. Homemade brews and various artists, everything from meat to roast. Bake creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. There's a lot of good and bad information out there about homebrewing, and we see a lot of it on the Doing the Most Discord server, which just recently crossed 1,000 members. I also see it on some of the homebrewing subreddits that I frequent, and so it felt like a good time to clear up some of the myths and half-truths specifically about natural brewing. It seems like a lot of the folks who are new to homebrewing, especially on the wine, mead, and cider side of homebrewing, a lot of them are introduced to the hobby through platforms about natural homebrewing methods. And those may be blogs or forums or YouTube channels or podcasts, but the platforms are generally focused on low cost, low upfront investment, both in equipment and in your own personal energy. But just like some of the old homebrewing books from the 70s and 80s, there's a lot of information out there that gets repeated and repeated enough that it becomes kind of part of the collective consciousness even though it's not really accurate. And sometimes it's just flat out wrong. So I wanted to make this quick video to address 10 of those things. And these are all 10 things that I have personally had to address as misinformation on our Discord server. If you would like to join our Discord server, it's discord.doingthemost.org. Number one, there's a cheap and natural replacement for everything. Just starting off, generally, if you're seeing some kind of powder go into something on this channel, nine times out of 10, it is natural. Citric acid, malic acid, wine tannin, they're all natural. They're natural ingredients. They just are. And replacing something like that, like for example, powdered citric acid, an isolated acid with something like lemon juice or lime juice is difficult to do without also bringing in the flavor of lemons or limes. That's why citric acid or malic acid or tartaric acid or lactic acid in their barest forms are like a fine tuning knob for balance that works really well. Or powdered wine tannin, which is generally made from ground up chestnut. It's perfectly natural and it's way easier to dial in your tannin profile with powdered wine tannin than it is something like black tea, which a lot of times ends up tasting like black tea. Sure, you could make some tamarind paste and use that to adjust the tartaric acid profile, or you could use papaya skins as a replacement for pectic enzyme and it will kind of work. But generally these things don't work as well as just using the natural form of the powder in order to achieve a better result. Are there kind of replacements for everything? Sure, but almost always they carry some kind of downside. Number two, time heals all brews. This is just not true. And you can take that lesson from my four-year-old orange and Merlot mead that just still tastes like trash four years later. Time can definitely help things smooth and mellow, but also time for aging works typically on a bell curve. So for example, country fruit wines, at about two years, they're hitting the top of that bell curve. So it starts out, tasting kind of rough, time improves it, but then after it peaks, time starts to become a detriment and starts to make it taste worse rather than better. There are a lot of things that can affect a brew when it's in the bottle. Tidal forces, environmental stuff, temperature, even light. But really when a brew doesn't taste great, you should balance it before it goes into the bottle because then you have more of an opportunity for time to smooth and mellow and make it more cohesive. Saying that time is gonna fix something that tastes bad is just outright dishonest because a lot of times it's gonna taste bad regardless. But if you fix it before it goes into the bottle, your likelihood of it tasting good at some point is way higher. Leaning on the advice that you should just wait and maybe your brew will eventually taste good is dishonest. What the real advice should be is to make it taste good before it goes in the bottle. For more information on that, check out our video on balancing. Number three, binding agents strip flavor. The half truth on this is that flavor is always being equated to something good, as if using a fining agent is going to remove good flavor from your brew. 
generally if you're using a fining agent that is going to strip flavors, you're using it with the intention of removing something that you don't like. Sparkaloid, bentonite, and kieselsol plus kaidazan are proven time and again, both in homebrewing and in the industry, not to affect flavor negatively. But there are some fining agents that do strip flavor. Activated charcoal is often not recommended because it can strip both color and flavor. Sometimes gelatin is the right choice because it reduces unwanted tannins and proteins. Isinglass removes harshness and astringency. These actually may make your brew taste better. So yeah, sometimes fining agents can strip flavor, but usually when you're stripping flavor with fining agents, you're doing it to create a positive impact on your brew. It's not just somehow going in and removing all the good flavor from your drink. And I kind of don't understand why the natural brewing community is often against finding agents, because there are natural finding agents like bentonite that can be used and still align with that brewing philosophy. Just remember, you always drink with your eyes first. And if something looks gross, it's gonna trick your brain into thinking that it is gross. Number four, bread yeast. 71B or EC1118 are all you need. Yeast is a tool, just like any other tool you use in home brewing. Bread yeast is like one of those little squeaky hammers. 71B is like a 5 16 wrench. It's good for a very specific use. EC1118 is like a Swiss Army knife, but a Swiss Army knife that also has a sledgehammer attached to the side of it. Each of these yeasts does certain things okay or even well, but none of the three is like the end-all be-all yeast for all brewers. Now, I understand there are some parts in the world where you can't get prepackaged wine or ale yeast and bread yeast may be all you have. If that's the case, obviously that's the tool that you have in your toolbox. But if you have access to wine or champagne or ale yeasts, you should use a yeast that's going to best benefit your brew. It's a dollar typically for a packet of wine yeast and it's worth the investment to get just what you want out of your homebrew. Choose the right tool for the job. Number five, natural brews turn out just as good. I mark this one down as a half truth because yeah, sometimes they do turn out just as good. Sometimes they probably turn out better. And some of that I think is up to skill and technique and some of that I think is up to luck. But a lot of times when I see this argument online, I equate it with the argument of, I've always done it this way and it turns out fine. But the like unsaid thing about fine is that you might not be living up to your potential. You might make really good homebrew using those practices, but just incorporating a couple of other things like using a champagne yeast or balancing your tannin or your acids might take those good brews to great. And you don't even know because you've boxed yourself into a philosophy where you've just flat out said, I can't use those things. Honestly, it's not being fair to yourself. Now, I totally appreciate the craft of trying to make good homebrew from stuff around the house, from the grocery store, from your garden. That's all fine and well, but a lot of the adjuncts, again, that we're using in modern wine and meat making practice are natural. And so there's no real reason to be averse to them unless it's just ideologically. And if that's the case, I guess that's fine. I just don't understand it. Number six, it's easier because it's simpler. I can see this one as a half truth philosophically. Yes, it's easier because it's simple, but then when you get to actually trying to balance the brew, it's not easier. You're fighting against added flavors from the other things that you're adding. Think back to our previous point, and so it actually becomes a lot more difficult to achieve proper balance. And you have a lot more head scratching and hand wringing trying to figure out where you're at in the balance wheel versus just being able to add in a little bit of malic acid or a touch of tannin and really fine tune those knobs. Really, it feels like the theme of this video is fine tuning. However, if you're committed to naturally balancing your brews, we've got a video on that. Number seven, sulfites or sorbate in your wine or mead are bad for you. Now, if you've got a sulfite allergy that's been confirmed by a doctor or somebody who's gonna be drinking your brew does, go ahead and skip to number eight. 
However, the general hearsay that sulfites and sorbate in the amount that you would be putting them in a wine are just somehow like irrecoverably bad for you is hogwash, honestly. A lot of times when you see this online, it's folks quoting abstracts from articles that they haven't actually read that in some instances the actual article doesn't agree with the claim that the person is making about the article, or it's just from folks who don't understand how parts per million work and don't understand that some things are safe in certain concentrations while not being safe in other concentrations. You know, a couple shots of vodka is not gonna hurt me at all, but if I drink a bottle of vodka right now, obviously I'm gonna be in the hospital later. And in the parts per million that sulfites are in wine or mead, it's generally recognized as safe. In the same way that basically all fast food, processed foods, a lot of the stuff that you see in the freezer section at your grocery store all have some level of preservatives in it, usually sorbate or sulfites. If you've eaten dried fruit, like dried apricots or dried apples, it's probably got sulfites in it. If you had a combo meal from your favorite fast food joint in the last month, yo, you've consumed sorbates in the last month. And I can almost guarantee you that my Big Mac meal is gonna have more preservatives in it than any bottle of wine or mead in my closet. And also just because you don't see sulfites on the label doesn't mean they're not in there. In the US, it doesn't have to be on the package if it's under 10 parts per million. Just because it's not on the label doesn't mean it's not there. Also lastly, there's this claim floating around out there that sulfites in wine or mead are gonna mess up your gut flora, like screw up your microbiome somehow. Alcohol, which is used as a sanitizer, it's used to wipe down surfaces, it's used to kill microflora, microfauna. Alcohol is in wine or mead, and alcohol is probably doing a lot more damage to your gut microbiome than a little bit of sulfites. Number eight, the magical CO2 blanket and rough racking. I've seen a lot of folks kind of in the last like two years, especially on r slash mead, talk about this practice of rough racking, of pouring their mead through a sieve to get solids or herbs or whatever out. And if you're pouring your mead at any point, you're introducing oxygen. Now, there are certain circumstances where you might wanna pour something. For example, if you've got a hydrogen sulfide fault in some wine, you might want to do what's called a splash racking, where you pour it back and forth from bucket to bucket until that rhino fart smell dissipates. In that case, you're introducing oxygen intentionally to combat that hydrogen sulfide fault. But generally pouring things, even if it's right out of primary, is going to be oxidizing for your brew. And when folks say, oh, I do this and I've never had a problem with oxidizing, all that tells me is they don't know what to look for or to taste for in oxidizing because it doesn't always just taste really horrible. You know, sometimes it can be subtle flavors like the flavor of sucking on aluminum foil. And as dad says that when he has perceived oxidized beer, it's tasted a little bit like sucking on aluminum foil. I've tasted it like tasting like wet cardboard or tasting slightly soured, not like vinegar, but slightly soured. It tastes a little bit different. And if you don't exactly know what you're looking for, you might miss it. When you pour liquid from one vessel into another, it mixes in oxygen, just like how a waterfall mixes in oxygen into the water for fish to use in their gills. It is happening, and just because a CO2 blanket is off-gassing, it's not protecting you from any of the oxygen that you're mixing in as you're pouring. Now, that CO2 blanket may protect you from more oxygen getting in, but as you're pouring, you're introducing it. I promise you, you're introducing it. And you can see this a lot of times in people's progression posts on forums or on YouTube videos where they start out with a nice red wine or mead. And then every time you see it thereafter, it gets a little browner and a little darker. And that's your visual cue that the brew has been oxidized. You don't even have to taste it to know. You can watch the browning happen in real time. Number nine, nutrients in wine or mead make them difficult to clear. This is just a lie. Actually, there's no evidence that this is the case. I know no one who's ever had this problem. If you watch the channel, you know that I use a higher nutrient load than probably any other brew tuber on YouTube. 
And like this is a great example here of this black limes mead that has cleared naturally on its own before I could even get to putting finding agents in it, which happens to me a lot. Nutrients don't somehow magically make things more difficult to clear. That's just bullshit. And finally, number 10, natural brewing saves you money. So circling back to one of our initial points, no, that's not the case. A lemon is more expensive than a gram of citric acid. A bag of tea is more expensive than a gram of tannin. A box of raisins is more expensive than a gram or two or three or five of powdered wine tannin. And boiling bread yeast to use as a nutrient. If you're using the proper amount, the actual amount of boiled bread yeast you should be using as a nutrient, it's gonna be as expensive, if not more expensive, than Fermate O. And a lot of times online natural brewers will not be using anywhere near the right amount of nutrient using boiled bread yeast as they should be using. They're using typically 10 to 20% of the nutrient load that they need, especially if they're making a mead. And the saving money thing is kind of, it goes for all of home brewing. If you're getting into home brewing to save money on your drinking hobby, you're playing yourself because that's not the case. Home brewing costs money and once you get hooked on the hobby, it costs more and more and more money. Thank you for watching. If you know any myths or half truths that I missed in this video, put them down in the comments. And even if they're myths or half truths about modern brewing practices, I'd still love to see those anecdotes in the comments as well. This isn't an attack video on the philosophy of natural brewing. I think everybody should brew however the heck they want to. I prefer modern brewing practices as you well know by now after watching this video, but I know some people ideologically fall within the natural brewing camp. And if that works for you, if it works for those folks, then I'm fine with that too. I just think it's unethical to spread misinformation, misleading information on the internet, especially when that information is gonna be found by people who don't know any better. You should be able to trust your teachers to tell you the truth and not to just feed you opinion framed as fact. It's something I try to be very careful about here on our channel, and I hope that effort is visible. You can join our Discord server, follow us on Instagram, all those things, and please, if you haven't yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click that subscribe button below this video, ring that bell for notifications, and you'll never miss a new Doing the Most video. Until next time, happy brewing, whether it be modern brewing or natural brewing. I hope you're still just making great stuff. Stay safe, and cheers.